Hi, everyone. Welcome to Engaging Gerontology Talks with myself, Zoe Byington, um, and Sherry Snelling. And we have a special guest here today, Aisha Young as well. Uh, brief overview about myself. You've probably heard before, graduate student at Georgetown studying aging and health. And I'm coming to you from Washington, D.C. And Sherry, what about yourself? I am a corporate gerontologist and the founder CEO of Caregiving Club, and I'm actually talking to you from Southern California. And Aisha, what about you? I am from Colorado Springs, Colorado, so I see we've got this nationwide thing going on here today. Point to point throughout the country. Yeah, we're covering all the regions. Yes. <laughs> um, do you want to decide or describe a little about what you do, who you are, that type of thing, and we'll jump into questions. Sure. So my name is Aisha Young. I am a gerontologist. So I have my bachelor's in gerontology, as well as my master's. And I'm currently working on my second master's in uh, pastoral theology um, from Xavier University of Louisiana. And your question was how I got into gerontology? Well, we'll get into that. We'll ask, yeah, why okay. did you decide to get degrees in gerontology? Good question. So <laughs> I'm one of the weird kids at school. Like, for example, my favorite movie was Cocoon when I was younger, and my favorite <laughs> actress was Jessica Tandy. Um, so yeah, not typical uh, for uh, children in the 80s, but I've always gravitated towards older people. Um, I had very close relationships with my grandparents. And I knew I was kind of weird in the fourth grade because we had um, our fourth grade class went to uh, uh, assisted living facility to have ice cream with the seniors. And I don't like ice cream to this day, but my concern was more about spending time with the seniors and I didn't care about the ice cream. And that is kind of when I knew like, hmm. And so when I was in high school and asking about career things and talking about what I wanted to do, um, I said, well, I want to work with old people, but I don't want to work in a nursing home because, of course, that was my, you know, interpretation of things um, at 17 years old. And my high school counselor was like, oh, you want to be a gerontologist? And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> and so I was actually fortunate enough to find a HBCU which is a historically black college and university uh, that had a gerontology program. Uh, and that was Bethune-Cookman University. I think there's only three out of the 130 HBCUs that have gerontology programs. So I was wow. like really fortunate. And isn't that amazing? Because we need so much, you know, we need many more gerontologists. And yet we find that a lot of the universities and colleges don't have these types of programs. Well, we're a very youth oriented society. And so if you're looking for anything regarding children, elementary education, anything of that sort, there's always going to be programs, opportunities, trades around that and not so much for gerontology. So I think we need a whole paradigm shift. But, um, you know, I'm fortunate that there was a career that that was able to fill my soul and was perfect for me. And, you know, 20 years into my career, there's not anything else that I want to do. Even with my um, going back to school for pastoral theology, um, you know, people ask why. And I say, well, you know, I'm heavily involved in church and, you know, I love God and I can put my love of God and seniors together by having a senior ministry and, and strengthening that um, theology skill to be able to do that. So. Yeah, I don't want to do anything else ever. It's job security. That's what I tell people. <laughs> That's too. right. If you want job true. security, work with seniors. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Super interesting also that when you were in high school, your counselor knew about being a gerontologist because I feel like that is really, really rare because we kind of pointed out a lot of people don't really know what gerontology is. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and the thing of it is, so when I applied for college, I knew I wanted to be a gerontologist, but all the schools that I applied to did not have gerontology programs. So I ended up applying as or going in as a nurse. That was my declared major. And I just wasn't happy because I was like, I don't like everybody. I just don't. Um, I'm not into kids, not particularly into adults, not into animals, so on and so forth. 
And so at the end of my freshman year, or at the end of the first semester of my freshman year, excuse me, I declared to be an English major because I was like, okay, I did not, I wasn't aware of the gerontology program yet or that, that how that was going to play out for me. And so I was, a, I declared to be an English major because I was like, oh, I can go into elder law. I'm really good at English. This is a strength of mine and this will be my path. And so once I, you know, met people in the gerontology program and talked to people and I was like, oh, this is who's who and this is what's what and this is what I can do. And, oh, you know, this is what this looks like for me and actually like got into it. That's when I declared my major is gerontology my um, my sophomore year. But I went in as nursing because that was the option for all of the the uh, colleges that I applied to. So, yeah, very interesting journey there that I've never really talked about. But, yeah, it was it's complicated because, you know, gerontology is not even something I think that is promoted in any school that I know of, except for like Wayne State. I would say that they do a really good job of promoting their gerontology program and outreach nationwide in terms of in-services and trainings. And you always know, you can like Google and see what's going on there. So I think that they do a really good job. And once again, um, I mentioned Wayne State because they too are an HBCU. And with me being an ethnogerontologist, like I, I'm seeking um, programs to be able to help me better serve my community with older African-Americans. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, I just love, okay, so ethnogerontologists, we're going to add that to our list because we're looking at how people describe themselves as gerontologists. I love that. That's that's one of our new terms that we're going to use. Yeah. So ethnogerontologists, it's, it's more of a um, term for people who are focused on a specific ethnic group. So, you know, you can be an ethnogerontologist and be focused on uh, our first people, our indigenous um, or our Asian, so on and so forth. So, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, really cool. And you kind of transitioned nicely into my next question a little bit. Um, we understand also like how you really fell in love kind of with gerontology, but how did that influence you to create African-Americans in gerontology? That's a good question. So. Um, going through school in, in all of the professional organizations that do outreach on campus. So there was like NSBE, which is the National Association of Black Engineers. And then you have Chi Eta Phi, which is um, the Black Nurses Association. And so really wanting to have an organization that was for Black gerontologists. And so there wasn't one as an undergrad. So I graduated in 2002. So, you know, I went along without my life and, and continued on with my education. So when I graduated in 2008 with my master's in gerontology, I was like, okay, there's a real gap here because where are all the people that I graduated with? Where are the people who are in this field? And then wanting to have um, mentorship in my area because I'm from Colorado, even though I went to school in Florida. So if I wanted to find somebody here in person to talk to and sit down with, obviously Zoom was not in existence at that time. And you know what I mean? Technology is definitely has its advantages now, but wasn't present then so much. So I was like, well, what's the best way for me to actually get what I want? And I thought that it would, it would be good to create that. So to create um, an organization to have mentorship because I was younger in my career then, but also to um, be able to come together as a collective to improve the quality of life of African-American elderly. I think that's so important when you have a group of people at a grassroots level who want to do something and make change, you know, you know, see, si say, pray, they, yeah, you know, yes, we can. So Right. I'm all about it, you know? <laughs> and so, um, Aisha, do you have um, members then from all across the country, different schools and, you know, different places? So I'm getting, me, I my expertise is not in nonprofit management. So that has been a challenge to promote and encourage people and say, you know, this is what we're trying to do. And that has had its own um, challenges, but also... I've shifted my focus as I've become a parent during that time and also pursued another degree. And so, yeah. And um, so, yeah. 
That's a lot yes, of balls. Yeah. That's a lot of balls that you're juggling. All yes. Once, right? and, and it can always be better. And I'm always seeking opportunities um, to make the organization better and strengthen the organization. So um, me and a few other people do different projects. Like, for example, we just did the People's Empowerment Project with the um, Center for uh, African-American Health here in Denver. And that is really to address the vaccine hesitancy that we had because of the pandemic. So that's like one of the latest, greatest things. And then um, of course, the research that I'm doing for my thesis. Um, so aside from that, um, one thing that we are doing is um, having a symposium that we're going to have in April to address um, attitudes towards advanced care planning from a African-American perspective. Um, you know, COVID really shown a light on the gaps in you know, if why aren't people filling out their advanced directives? And if you knew you only had three weeks to live because of COVID-19, would you have filled out your advanced directives and shoulda, coulda, woulda? But now there's more of an opportunity to get in front of people and sit down and address it and say, okay, what can we do? You know, you have a, a vested, uh, a person with vested interest in this, uh, actually a group of people, what can we do to make this better? So yeah, more projects on a local level than on a national level, but getting there. But getting there. I love that. Well, and you know, you said you were very close to your grandparents and Zoe and I have talked, I was close to my grandparents. Um, actually, when my parents divorced, I was about six and we wound up living with my maternal grandparents for Aww. a couple of years. Yeah. And then I, you know, helped my mom be a caregiver to them. But, you know, I'm really fascinated because you've done some really terrific work also in the LGBTQ community. And I wondered if you could kind of tell us a little bit about that, because you know, one of the things that um, I watched when I went through my gender ontology masters was um, the Jen Silent documentary. And it really, it really hit me. It really stuck with me. So tell me a little bit about your work in, in that community. So I'm a project visibility trainer. And what project visibility is, is um, it's specifically for aging people. And I believe that that came out of SAGE, but it's something that was done with the um, Boulder County um, Area Agency on Aging. And so with that training, it was really talking about aging in the LGBTQ plus community and what that looks like and how to advocate better and getting the terminology correct, getting the language correct, understanding like, oh, if you're trans, if you are trans um, male to female, yes, you still need to get an annual exam with an OBGYN and why. And those are things that some people don't think about and putting those things together and to really kind of um, you know, the the the, the thing about um, especially with ignorance and people's bias and negativity, as we know that education and exposure helps, you know, quelch those things. And so project visibility is one of those trainings that helps give that exposure and education as well so that people can, um, you know, be better advocates and serve the people that they work with better. Absolutely. You're so right. And I think sometimes we overlook, we want to do like a one size fits all, right? We know right. we know that's not true. There were a couple other things that you um, had done some work in that I was fascinated by. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about two things. One is I, I came across relocation stress syndrome, and I'm fascinated by that. If you can explain that for us, tell us about that. And then also I'm, I'm really interested in your latest thesis and master's in um, pastoral theology. How does your gerontology um, education and master's fit with both of those things? And tell us a little bit about those. Okay, so sure, the first question. So when I was doing my master's thesis for my gerontology degree, um, I came across some research that was done by Dr. Nicholas Castle. He is a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. And what relocation stress syndrome was, was really talking about um, exactly, I guess it's namesake, you know, the, the stress that comes with relocation, but really understanding what that looks like. I'll share with you that a year before I entered my master's program for um, gerontology, I lived in Louisiana and was a Katrina survivor. Uh -huh. And so that is what kind of 
led me to want to learn more about relocation stress syndrome and how to better help seniors because there are people who died in that hurricane. And if we knew then what we knew now, how could we better address that? Even with people who did survive and relocated, let's say you were in um, New Orleans evacuating from the hurricane and was permanently placed in New York. Right. Okay. So yes, you survive, but all of your things are gone. How do you start over? What is that doing to the psychological, um, your, your balance and things of that sort? So really understanding that there is different kinds of relocation stress. So relocation, when we're talking about relocation, we're talking about going from your home to a hospital. That's mm -hmm. a form of relocation. If you're going from hospital to an institution, mm -hmm. that is a form of relocation. If you're going from your home um, to an institution, so that's another one. And then when you're going from your home to the home of a relative. Right. So understanding that all those those different dynamics and things bring about different stresses. If you are moving, say, if you're um, a, an older person and you're moving in with your child, well, there are the rules of that house that creates its own. If you're dealing with um, transportation issues, because maybe you live in New York, I use that as an example because they have a subway system and like 24 hour transportation. If you live in New York and you move to Iowa, you know what I mean? Like what does not even being able to get around, you know, poses its own stress. So I'm um, talking about that when you're, um, you know, balancing doctors, and, and appointments and medications and, and understanding that that is playing a role um, holistically on the health and well-being of that senior and to be mindful of that. Yeah. And then when you're talking about extreme cases like a hurricane, you know what I mean? So like more. what, what do you do? So I thought that um, shedding some light on what, what relocation stress is would be helpful. Um, just, you know, once again, education and exposure, I had the education. So it was good for me to share that with other people. Yeah. I love, I love that. And, and, and the way that you explain it, you know, you're right. When you read the words, it's kind of like, oh, I kind of get it. But then you think about all these different things. Tell me how your gerontology background is now, you know, going to be integrated with your pastoral theology and how you're going to use that. Well, so one thing I, I'm a proud black Catholic. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to say it. I'm not afraid to show it. You know, when I was getting dressed for this interview, I had a t-shirt that has the black Catholic saints on there. And I was like, oh, maybe not so much professional. No, you should go for it. <laughs> you knew you with that. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, so I'm pursuing my, um, pastoral, uh, a d second master's degree in pastoral theology from Xavier University of Louisiana from the Institute for Black Catholic Studies. And I thought it best because I wanted to do more things with church, but I wasn't able to find how to combine my gerontology with my love of God and pastoral theology was that bridge. And so being able as a theologian to be able to work within the diocese, you know, with, with that training and saying, hey, additionally, this is my expertise and being able to better serve the seniors in this diocese. I think senior ministries are important. I think, um, you know, especially for Catholics, uh, you know, a religious education is a lifelong journey. It does not end just because you get confirmed and you have your, um, you know, your first communion and things of that sort. It's a lifelong journey. And I feel like seniors are often left out of that journey. Mm -hmm. And so what does that look like, especially if you are retired and you want to um, be fulfilled? Religion is... Um, something that is, um, I don't want to say like larger with seniors, but there's more of it's a, important a to them towards the end of life about religion. And so how do we best serve those seniors with those desires? Um, and also to combining, um, religion with things like advanced care directives, let's mm -hmm. say, um, yeah. you know, one thing that I have found is that, uh, a challenge, particularly for African Americans, uh, with the, with advanced care planning, is the question becomes: um, Well, why would I have a contract with man when I have a relationship with God? 
-hmm. Why do I need this piece of paper if my goal is to get to the kingdom? And as long as I get there, you know, I don't need any of this stuff. And so with me as a gerontologist being able to say, hmm, you know, I understand as a gerontologist, all these things and why it's important and, and isn't autonomy autonomy important to you. And when our people were enslaved, there was no autonomy. And you know, the what happened in in death looked very different than it does now. And how can I as a gerontologist, especially as an ethno gerontologist, be the best? So I really want to have um, really comprehensive, really thorough, um, you know, I guess, older adult catechesis for, you know, older Black Catholics, but just older people in general who are in a ministry. I think that, um, you know, religion, we're all, we're not all Christians, but I'm just saying with, with, when I say we're all Christians, like with me being Catholic, I can share the same information with somebody who's Baptist, some sure. bo- the same information with somebody who's Methodist, so on and so forth. Even so far as uh, somebody who's Muslim, you right. know what I mean? If we're right. talking about the issues of aging you know what i'm saying right information can be shared across the board so absolutely yeah i was gonna say i really find it fascinating how you've incorporated gerontology into the like things that you're passionate about in life so like your religion for example and i think that's really showcasing kind of how gerontology plays into the whole life course like you said it's not just like here or there it's important all across the board um and then like, it kind of inspires me to kind of think about as I'm entering the field of gerontology, like what am I passionate about and how can I mesh those two together? Cause I think it's really cool. Um, last question before we leave super cool stuff you've been talking about, by the way, I think you've been highlighting things that people think about, but like, also, like you said, people aren't like education exposed to it. So they don't really know at the same time. Um, But in the, you know, coming years, how do you see the gerontology field changing and how can future gerontologists help play a role? Wow. Loaded question. Question. Okay. (laughs) Ask me again. Okay. (laughs) Ask me again. So gerontology field, we know it's going to be exploding in the future. How you're a student right now, I'm a student. How can we see the role of future gerontologists kind of playing into that? like expanding and like our, like we were just talking about our passions for the future, helping it to all different aspects of life. What do you think? Ooh. Okay. Now I have an answer. Okay. So this is, this is my, like, ideally like in a perfect world, I think research is important. I would never want to take away from that. I think that researchers, you know, when you're finding drugs for, um, Alzheimer's and other types of dementias and things of that sort, you know, you need people to be willing and wanting to do that research. But I think it is just as important to be practicing. And me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the practice of gerontology. So I'm one of those people who likes to hug and kiss and be in your face and talk to you and get the more qualitative data than the quantitative data. And I think that having people having the um, general like for seniors, you know, once again, with us being a a youth oriented society and there's so much ageism and so many negative connotations when you think about aging. And I think having people who don't have those biases, implicit or explicit um, towards seniors and being able to really practice gerontology, being able to really serve and, um, you know, and, and, and it's fine if you're like me and you're just like, I want to work with old people, but, and I don't want to work in a nursing home. Well, you know, there's also legislation that needs to be passed. Like we need like some overhauls of our laws. (laughs) And, you know, when we're talking about discrimination for people uh, uh, with age, you know, are we hiring people? If if you're just a person who maybe doesn't want to be a gerontologist, but it's just like, hey, you know, I don't see a problem with hiring somebody 70 years old. As a matter of fact, in my staff of 20 people, I don't see a problem having 10 of them be over the age of 70. And really having that mind shift, I think that that's the most important thing. So I think like everybody, whether you're a gerontologist or not, can do something to help better, you know, what it looks like for seniors to live here. I think, you know, when you look up 
places to retire and people are like, oh, we're age friendly this and they have their plaque or something on the wall. We are age friendly. Well, but really, what does that look like? Because if you can't tell me how you're doing it, you know, in covering like housing, employment, you know, is this a food desert? Because food deserts equal pharmacy deserts. Older people have chronic diseases. So, you know, now they can't get food or their medicine to be better. So really thinking about all of these things. And so I think everybody could like practice gerontology in a practical way. I love that. I love that. (laughs) We need that on a (laughs) t-shirt. I know, right? Like, let me... That's a lot of lines, though. That's, That's right. Of, I need a logo. <laughs> just yeah, say, right. just see you say like seniors, and then right. people can just like seniors. Right. Yeah. Well, we were talking to somebody the other day, and we were saying, you know, it's the one thing that we all have in common. We're all going to get older. So let's make it a better place for ourselves, if not for all the other people we love and everybody else out there. Right. And also, I think that, um, you know, if we had more people who were, willing to do the work, I think that that'd make it easier for the sandwich generation. And I point specifically to the sandwich generation because that's what I'm in now. You know, I have a nine-year-old and then I have parents who are in their seventies. And so it's like, oh, okay. So it was easier to do all this stuff before I had to apply it to my real life. So now that I have to apply it, okay, this is what it looks like. And you know, what does caregiver stress look like? You know what I mean? Because if we serve our caregivers better, that makes it easier for them to care for our seniors. So it's like really like circular. Yeah. Life course. It is. (laughs) Well, this has been great. This has been so enjoyable. We could probably do a whole nother 25 minutes. With we you. can just keep talking, honestly. Anytime you want to have me back, I'm game for it. <laughs> oh. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I want to give a little plug to African Americans in Gerontology. I think it's a super cool organization. And I know it's probably just going to be expanding into the future as more old, as there's more older people. Yes. And I want to say thank you too. And thank you for giving it. You're our ethno gerontologist as part of this series. So thank you for that. Thank (laughs) you ladies. Well, this is great. And um, again, thanks again. And thanks Zoe for everything. Yep. And this was engaging gerontology talks. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay. So I'm going to stop recording. Yay. That was wonderful. Really cool. I love really that. Cool. And, you know, as you were talking, um, I'm just going to say this. Friends, so, wait, so I do a whole separate podcast called um, Caregiving Club on Air. And I've been looking for someone who can speak to kind of that spiritual side, you know. So I want to have you back on. I want to have you come okay. back and talk a little bit about that kind of stuff. That would be great. So, but this was wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and for, you know, being part of this. Thank you. Um, are, is this going to air somewhere or can I, can I help promote this? Yes. Well, so <laughs> this can be promoted on Sherry's uh, YouTube website, Caregiving Club, and also going to be showcased um, in my class at Georgetown. So we're going to be promoting you as well, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, and you said and also, what is caregiving club? Yeah, I'll That's send you scary. my info. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I do a separate podcast. We're gonna hopefully maybe turn this into a podcast series as well. We're we're looking at that, but it'll be up on our YouTube channel for sure. But if you could send us your photo and okay. make sure we have your bio, because we will promote it on social media and we would love you know your support when it goes live. So that'd be great. Absolutely. And also. Maybe this is a connection for you, but I have a classmate who just graduated in May. Okay. African American, 70 years old, and she is trying to figure out her next steps in her career. So I think if you're interested, it would be really interesting if maybe I could connect you two just to have someone to talk to because she uh she's, you know, she's been a nurse for her whole life and she decided to do this degree and she's like, what am I gonna do? So I think it'd be really cool if I could connect you guys. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, thank you. She's super (laughs) nice. Lee Reed, she's like the best. Okay. <laughs> well, Aisha, it's just great meeting you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, ladies, I will right. be in touch by email. So and good luck on your great. thesis. Yeah. Thank you so much. July 14, 2023. It's happening. It's coming. There we go. All Less right. than a year. <laughs> good luck with everything. Have a great Thank one. You. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye.